for those of you playing along at home, um, the homework for tonight is uh, go to YouTube and find the video Nessun Dorma, Who Sings It Best, or Who Sung It Best. It's a comparison of about uh, 15 or 20 tenors um, with the crescendo in Nessun Dorma. It's uh, pretty amazing. And then also uh, Sea Jam Blues by the Oscar Peterson Trio, live from a recording in Denmark in 1964. Ron Brown on bass, Ed Thigpen on drums, and Oscar Peterson on the keyboards. So this is a discussion I had with the uh, Advanced Swing Trade guys uh, mastermind yesterday, and they recommended that I discuss it today, so I will. Uh, and it has to do um, with the paradox of uh, Wu Wei, or Wu Wei, I should say correctly. Uh, effortless action, and, it, and there's a real strong connection to the concept of spontaneity and authenticity and genuineness. Uh, we know Wu Wei to be best translated as effortless action. And I am relying on the scholarship of Edward Slingerland, professor from University of British Columbia, Vancouver, his book, Trying Not to Try, and every lecture he's put on YouTube, which I've been listening to for the last couple of weeks. And he says more elegantly than I will uh, what uh, these four ancient Chinese philosophers have to say about uh, the paradox of trying not to try and how it pertains to, uh, to the trader's mind. So he introduces his book and most of his talks talking about uh, a game called Mind Ball, in which uh, you have two players and a table, and you're trying to move a ball to the other end of the table with the power of your mind. And so you're hooked up to uh, EKG or whatever that is, the, the mind sensor. And you move the ball by generating alpha and beta waves, which are created when you are in a relaxed state mentally. So if you can achieve a state of relaxation, you generate alpha and beta waves. That moves the ball. If you can be more relaxed than your opponent, then you, uh, you can win. He describes the phenomenon of closing his eyes, becoming relaxed, hearing the sound of the game, announcing that somebody was winning and he had to open his eyes to look and he discovered that the ball um, had moved all the way down here and now he was winning and then the realization that he was winning destroyed his relaxed state and he, the harder he tried to get back into relaxation the more unrelaxed he became and so that active effort uh, at trying prevented him from becoming relaxed. And so this, uh, and he lost the game. So there's this paradox, this conundrum of trying not to try. We want to be able to not try in order that we can get into a, uh, we would call the flow state, uh, in which everything is just right. And there's some, some good science on what that is like. Uh, a scholar whose name is pronounced Chiximikai but which cannot be spelled by mortal man, uh, who's done a lot of work in that area and also in systems thinking. But if you look up the word flow state and an author, you'll see Chicksimic high and then you'll realize what I mean. So flow state is correlated with uh, excellence in performance in sports, art, craftsmanship of any kind. Uh, and it's a place we want to be. It feels just naturally correct. Well, the Chinese understood this. And um, 
2,500 years ago, they were talking about the concept of Wu Wei, this effortless action. And when you are in a state of Wu Wei, you generate what uh, an aura of, it's pronounced, de. And it, you could think of that as charisma. Uh, and so if you're in Wu Wei, you generate charisma, and then people are naturally attracted to you, they want to follow you, they want to be with you, because there is some essential connection between the state you are in and the larger world around you. You're in some kind of proper relationship to everything around. So when you are in that effortless action, you find your place and you perform just so, and it feels very artistic and genuine and effortless, and that creates that emotional feeling of duh, which makes uh, people want to follow you. And so there's the science behind this of spontaneity is this notion that we have um, these two systems. We have a, a system one and a system two, and that system one is the hot system and it's uh, emotional, uh, automatic. It runs the It runs the body. And then there is some kind of cold system that is slow, focused. This, oh, the, I, system one is fast and frugal. You'll see that a lot in the literature about heuristics. Slow, focused, limited, uh, costly, rational. This is system one and system two from Kahneman uh, and Tversky's work. You know, they're Kahneman's magnum opus that summarizes a lifetime of scholarship, uh, thinking fast and slow. Um, well, one of the things that seems to happen with spontaneity is that we are brains in a social network that uh, give off waves um, uh, of energy. And, uh, you know, we detect, we detect each other's emotional states and our brains act not only to regulate our physical state and mental state, but also it has a impact or an influence on the states of others. So that's just to say that we are emotional creatures, uh, social creatures. And we have uh, evolved in think in system one, this hot system, this emotional, intuitive, fast and frugal, we get some kind of sense um, when we're meeting another person, if, if they are acting in a way in the, in the context of the environment, if they're acting in a way that feels spontaneous and genuine, we get a sense that they're being who they really are when they are spontaneous and allows us to make a snap judgment that there is a strong connection now between spontaneity and trustworthiness. That we are more likely to place trust in people who are spontaneous in the world because we get a feeling that they, uh, that we can predict who they are or that we can know who they really are and how they're going to behave in future states. And so we end up trusting their authenticity. Well, one of the things then that happens is when you're in a flow state, uh, you are really emphasizing system one. Um, things just happen to you. You don't need this conscious focused thought, this rational approach to make your decisions. You know, basketball players just move the spot, they get the ball, and they hit that shot in rhythm and so they're being spontaneous and that's who they really are and so they're trustworthy so so this uh, uh this quality of spontaneity and trustworthiness and flow state that we see in others is called day duh well how do you get there because clearly you'd want to be there because that that performs so these four philosophers uh spoke about that and they sort of have the advantage uh, because they did not experience the mind-body split um, 
that was characteristic of the Western Enlightenment, you know, thanks to uh, Descartes, to Kant, those guys who saw a sharp distinction between the mind and the body and really emphasized the hyper-rational, which kind of corresponds to uh, system two. And they saw that as distinct, whereas these guys all are operating from the condition of an embodied mind in which the mind is connected to and part of the body and indistinguishable from it. And so you don't get that uh, separation between these two ways of knowing uh, that is characteristic of Western philosophy in some schools. So this is a word, this is a world of the embodied mind. And that therefore the there is a relationship between the state of the body and the state of the mind. It has it's a two-way street. You know, at some point your brain is a, you know, whatever it is, eight pound piece of meat that generates signals and regulates the body that's carrying it around. If you want to have your mind blown, uh, spend some time on YouTube and listen to this guy, Yosha Bach, talk about computational uh, brains. Just, uh, it's just uh, amazing. Amazing guy. Well, so here we are wanting to achieve Wu Wei, Wu Wei, and there are these four particular methods. So if we, I want to introduce the idea of a block of wood, that if what we are started as a block of wood, um, this is what those four guys would say. Uh, Confucius would say that you take that block of wood and through rigorous uh, carving and polishing through ritual, form, function, and decades of effort, you can smooth that thing down until all that's left is this finely crafted, disciplined uh, piece of wood artifact that then feels effortless because you've ground away all the rough edges. So it's this uh, attention to detail, social rituals, rules, and regs. Living in that society was kind of uh, how Confucius would talk about it. And then after decades of effort, then you could just effortly, effortlessly do things because you'd ground away all the other things that weren't effortless. Uh, Lao Tzu um, of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching would say, no, that's completely wrong. What you need to do is go the other way. You need to go towards the uncarved block, uh, back to nature, reject society, live simply. He was a hippie before being a hippie was cool. And so you need to reject all those forms of an artificially developed society. You just need to be simple and natural and just let it be. Um, Mencius was uh, a later Confucian. And he talked about this block of wood, but in a special way, he said, you know, um, there are these four sprouts that grow out of that block of wood that correspond to the Confucian values of uh, benevolence, uh, compassion, humility, service and respect, uh, or said another way, duty. And that um, although there may be these other potentials inside you, he didn't spend as much time talking about those devils of our worst nature he spent more time on these uh, these possibilities of our better nature, which conformed with the Confucian traditions. And he said that if you act as um, 
you know, a gardener and cultivate and take care, you can actually encourage these sprouts to, uh, to develop, but you can't overdo it in the same way that sometimes a Confucian approach might be just going through the rituals without really believing in it and overdoing it but without ever getting the underlying substance, which was sort of the Lao Tzu's uh, concern there was that you could be a hypocrite as a, as a Confucian and never really believe it. So uh, Mencia says, well, you know, a farmer can tend to the crops and they can grow and he can care for them and he can protect them against, you know, varmints and rabbits and whatnot. And, um, but you can't go faster than their nature. Like you, there's the famous story from the Mencius about, um, his book was called The Mencius. Uh, and the farmer who went out to his crops and tried to make them grow faster by stretching them and then it ended up killing him because he was trying to and uh, impose an unnatural effort onto them and so they couldn't handle that and that so it defeated the purpose so that would sort of find him grounded in in the earth and natural ways but with some effort you get the naturalness of Lao Tzu, but also the effortful action in a certain ways from Confucius. And so you get grounded in the things that you're doing from your perspective. Well, Zhuang Tzu uh, was a, comes from the Taoist tradition, but is not a Lao Tzu kind of guy. And he says there is some kind of divine pattern uh, or spirit, and that uh, as as humans we have this connection uh, to the divine and to the divine in the world of nature around us. You know, there's there's all these things which also have connections to the divine, and that if you can concentrate on the uh, the larger harmonious pattern with the universe and find that pattern and then just release the spirit. Now you can, you can be seen as a mind, body, and spirit with you in the middle. And so if you can emphasize the spiritual element and maybe shut down the mind a little bit, uh, like he would say that Confucius was too much on the mind and the actions and wasn't connected to deep spirit. So in Zhuangzi's world, if you can find and then just release that divine spirit and act in accordance with that pattern, then all things will be made easy and natural. So he talks about the butcher who's able to um, carve up the ox with his knife without ever breaking a sweat or dulling his knives because he just naturally finds the space between the bones and the ligaments to separate the meat from the carcass and is able therefore to be in perfect alignment. He acts just so. So if we were to, um, and this is where I'll add some stuff then. So if we saw the connection between the continuum between Lao Tzu and Confucius as how much effort and social interaction should drive your effort, you would see them at opposite ends of that. And then if you drew the connection between Zhuangzi and Mencius, Mencius would be very much focused on the earthly application and the immediacy of your surroundings and kind of a bottoms up approach, but still connected in some ways to these potentials inside you. And Zhuangzi would be more on the divine side and, and being in alignment with heaven. And so each of those guys uh, avoids the extremes of those. So Slingerland talks about this. And so, and so the paradox is, is that each one of those ways is a way to achieve a state of Wu Wei, effortless action under certain circumstances. And so as an embodied mind going around in your environment, there will come times in which that uh, either a Confucian approach or a Lao Tzu approach or a Mencius approach or a Zhuangzi approach is a way in which you can get into that state of Wu Wei and spontaneity, and create Da, which uh, sort of is that feeling that you are aligned properly. Um, and and so, uh, but there's no one that always dominates all the time in Slingerland's view. 
and uh, so there's this uh, what what threads all of these things together is that whole overall paradox of how do I get in how do I try by any one of those four means uh, to get into that state of uwe um, trying not to try so those four ways of thought give us insights and ways to interpret what's going on and to understand our life and this larger paradox without getting lost in the excessive uh, logic traps, if you will, of um, the mind-body split of Descartes and Kant, and then the rejection of those. Um, the, the idea of the embodied mind uh, really resonates with me. So what does that mean for us you know, as traders and, you know, okay, Ken, what's the point? Well, to me, if you look at these guys uh, manifesting their music in the world, uh, they're all craftsmen, and yet they're also animated by these divine spirits. And it's clear that they made choices about how to proceed and how to train, but in a way that was natural. And there is a certain elemental experiential quality about the way they are in the world that is reminiscent of Lao Tzu, of just being and the energy that that gives. And then the idea of focused, responsible, but um, proper practice that comes from Mencius. And then the, the focus on, you know, living in the world as a member of society of Confucius. And then this notion of the finding the divine pattern and losing yourself in it in order to find you. You find yourself by losing yourself in that divine pattern. And so in my view, when I am performing my best and I've got some kind of, you know, RLCO stuff going on and, the, you know, the RL10 has come down just so and the RL30 is there and starting to roll up and the, uh, the dragon is just so and uh, is starting to curl up, then uh, there are just moments where that entry point um, uh, just feels correct and effortless, and then the uh, the Wu Wei exit strategy just seems like a, a a reasonable enough way to to finally take that exit, and I can find myself in this divine pattern in the way that Chuang said would talk about, and that I can use my after action review to uh, work on those positive psychological, emotional, social qualities of benevolence and compassion and humility and duty that Mencius talks about. And I can just enjoy the act of trading and not find it to be um, draining, which helps me generate the emotional energy that I can then draw on when I'm in the Uwe state. And then by sort of documenting that practice and going through the rituals and forms and discipline of Confucius, not as an end in itself, but as just sort of a way to complete, to complete the circle and the cycle, then it just feels like um, when I'm at my best, I do see elements of all four of those thinkers um, manifesting in me when I'm at that uh, Wu Wei. So if I think about this now in terms of knowledge of the head, heart, gut, hands, uh, and feet in that little circle of uh, Wu Wei, you know, I, I find that rational mind reflected in sort of the understanding of Confucius and Mencius and the knowledge of the heart kind of uh, connecting with the heart and, and spirit of Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu, knowledge of the gut, dealing with sort of the uncertainty and uh, being able to free myself of that with the, um, and, and at least integrate that in by, I think, finding some of the mentions and the natural uh, response to opportunity coming from Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu as part of the larger pattern. That's just, it just has to be there. And then the knowledge of the hands of how to do things and then the the energy that comes from being in the state of Uwe gives my feet that knowledge of how to walk that path, how to continuously keep going and develop the resilience to keep going. So I find a strong connection between all four of those guys and this notion of Uwe and spontaneity and truth sensing and alignment. Um, 
as a way to um, help me integrate all the things that come out of the lessons learned. So when I'm going through the rituals of the, um, you know, the Confucian approach to um, doing the Kata challenge and the daily AARs, and filling out the forms and um, uh, recording my trades and analyzing the the data and then updating my to-do list. In many ways, that's the Confucian uh, scholar in me, you know, just making sure that I go through the rituals in the forums because those will set you free. But realizing that what I'm trying to do is connected to that to that uh, divine spirit of Zhuangzi and then trying to work on those other qual those social qualities that matter to Mencius. And then remembering just to enjoy the moment too in a simple way, like a simple monkey uh, in order to um, regenerate and refresh and just laugh with the experience. So you see a lot of laughter in the work that Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu. You see a lot of thinking and responsibility in Mencius and Confucian. You see due diligence in Confucius and then focused effort and quality practice in Mencius. And all of that is just sort of um, um, connected to this, this connection to the divine here in the middle of, uh, of Wu Wei which for me just feels kind of like that. Uh, if, I were, if I could draw better, I'd make that a little yin-yang symbol in there and it'd be much better. Pretend that's a, <laughs> you could pretend that that is a, a yin-yang center. That's, that's sort of how I see the connection. So uh, I would in, uh, invite you to listen to Slingerland's talks and he'll explain it better than I, but I've done my best on that and that's enough for now. So you've got your homework and your, uh, your thought piece. Well, let's take a look at what we have. Um, I do want to give great praise to, uh, to Ken Hum. And I think he said, as usual, he has set a new standard for us on these, uh, these charts. He's incorporated you know, I think the best ideas from Jeff and Sonal about the multi time frame analysis. Uh, and so I would encourage you guys to adopt the same approach on these charts going forward. So we're looking at, uh, at uh, Dow Chemical. So on a weekly, we can see uh, there was this. Loving it. Loving it. So here's that. You know, if, if that's leg one and leg two, um, this is like leg three is fully manifested. And so I, I just feel like if this can get above here, then the top of that box is certainly, you know, 58 is in range. And now you can see when we zoom in on this now to the daily, that this peak corresponds uh, to that peak. Now we can feel the, uh, the sell off, the winter, the supported spring crossing. Um, you know, the Uwe exit would be this. And would have been out approximately here because of the failure to follow through. And then you have this. So this now feels like an opportunity to get Kata 2. Abbreviated as K2, the mountain, the more difficult mountain to climb than Everest even. Right? And so what Ken's got for us here is... Um, There's 55, that would be like 54, 
So that's about a 1.5 risk. So here's a clear, here's a clear target he's marked off. Uh, here is a, a target that 5950. It's also kind of a Z2 excursion and now a Z3 excursion from here. So if we were to go 5550 to 5950, that's plus four at 1.5 and that gives us you know like 2.6 to 1 reward to risk that's in great shape uh, I would agree with a second entry then right here at 5750 because now you would have had two bucks in hand and you wouldn't lose money on that trade and the other thing that makes this nice is that the high corresponds to a break of the of the dragon so that thing is in great shape um on the short side what would our targets be well here's a fair value here is that connect oops that connects with um the belly of the dragon uh, i would say this that support level or that resistance level is now a target on the way down and if that breaks then this gets us right into the middle here and this piece of the dragon so there are three clear targets to the downside so if you got short here at 1.5 with a again a 1.5 risk you'd be getting uh 3.5 to 1.5 so that would be about 2.5 to 1 on the first target and then these other ones would be places that you could add positions And then if that broke down, man, look out below. Um, it would take the whole industrial sector to break down. This would be uh, an extraordinary breakdown if it got below that. So I think the realistic target certainly is here. That would be this. You would then expect it to start getting resistance there because that's also the place where they bought it here and it gave you here. So if this thing fell down to this level and started to work its way back up, you would respect the power of that move. And this is where you'd do the two R battle drill. And you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, demand that it get through there as if you were correct. You would respect the fact that's a that's a place where it bounced before. But that's that gives you a reasonable capture in here of re, uh, of downside and then there's your upside. So that makes this a perfect uh, critical state right in here nicely organized well done Ken and so I want you to just feel the uh, the goodness of incorporating a weekly and a daily uh, on the same chart for you there that's a really nice way to array it so plus one All right, so this is a CRM, Salesforce. Uh, so this weekly corresponds to that. This, um, this turning point, uh, I think was Probably this one. Yeah, that's this. So we had one, two. Now you can see the power. This is a, a Kata 2 trade here. The K2 from the weekly. makes this really good, just so you can see that. 
and then the breakout from Z3 on that on the weekly was about uh, 240, which is here. So if you'd had your weekly and daily side by side, you would have seen this as a really positive moment when it broke out of this rising Z3 line. Now that's telling you there's real power in that move, which would then allow you to get from 240 to like the 290 range. Well, now we notice um, this rollover here is this rollover there. So I'm going to make that blue. So now I want you to notice that this uh, this little formation here, this one, two, three, now gives you this uh, this lower highs, and that makes this a collapsing dragon signal at uh, was it two forty five. There's your short signal from the weekly, although you can even front run that on the daily now. So if you were short from 256, when it breaks down here, you're getting a confirmation from the weekly that this thing is breaking down. And now you got a three week uh, move down into here. But now you got a 10 day failure to fail further which now makes this feel really good because now this is finding support at the same place this broke out and gave you that powerful move. And now you can think of this as just some kind of long um, choppy consolidation zone on the weekly chart, which doesn't feel like anything except a breakdown and now a ramp up. So that's what this feels like, is that you're getting this early in the winter is becoming spring. And now you have the possibility just to get back to the Bollinger Band mean with that much risk. You have one, two, three, four units of reward just on the daily to get back to 245, which is just in the middle of the weekly. And so if this can break out, then the top of the daily dragon at 260 is here, which is the PSAR on the weekly. And then if that breaks out, now you have a pathway. Because uh, now you have, because when you break out at 260, you will have left, you will have less, left all this down. Then you can see 275, 290. So I want you to just notice the power of the weekly and the daily put together. And what feels like oscillating and uh, tradable moments on the daily. And oh, by the way, on an hourly, you can actually be trading this little oscillation in here, this RL10. There's actually room to play that on the hourly charts or the 30 minute charts. I'm not showing that on here, but that's certainly possible. And you'd have been happy to have done that because you would have really crushed that downward move. So, uh, this little weekly sideways quiet channel is just stabilizing uh, all the enthusiasm that ran up here. And so this little fake one go to is what that feels like on the weekly. So I really like this one to the upside. But now you can see, well, what about the downside, Ken? Well, yeah, if this thing now fails here, then it's coming back into all of this crowd which is down here where Ken has marked off 195. So if this thing collapses out of here where he wants to get short at about 222, then the move to 195 is there, and that's $27. So if he can manage a $9 risk somewhere in here, he can get 3 to 1 on the short. And then, um, and then he's got the nice reward to risk on the way up. So uh, 
really nice work on Salesforce. This initial burst, we will recall, comes from their announcement of being added to the uh, F, uh, adding adding them to the Dow when they came on board with Honeywell. So this was all that urge of initial buying, and this was all the consolidation of that, and then this was this is the next significant run, and this feels really good right here. I think this cleared cleared all the weak hands out of there, and now. This thing is uh, has good potential to go, but again, if it breaks down, you just follow the road signs and you let you let it you let price pull you into that trade. All right, so this is, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, that was CRM. I already had that one on there. Sorry, just a moment. Oh, I see, I opened, oh, this should be, this should be Neo is what I'm looking for. So on the weekly, so there's our Z3, oops, something you can see there. There's our Z3 pinch in this beautiful Peace star on the weekly. I, I don't know that you need anything different, my friends. If you're not paying attention to weekly charts and just using the the peace star to guide you, I just I don't know what to say. That's just the way to do it. There's a Z3 pinch breakout, which gets you in at six. And with a PSR risk of four, exit anywhere you want. Even if you waited for the PSR exit, that's uh, plus 28 on a $2 risk. So now all we're talking about is the froth. Froth is good. Uh, for daily charts. Weekly froth is good for daily charts. All right, so here's that peak. Here was that previous peak. Strong support here at 42. Five days up. There's that strong support now at the weekly low at 42. This little business here was the little washout that um, is in the noise to just clean up the nervous in the service guys. Yeah, all this is good. This is where it starts getting frothy. You have this, 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 this 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 you know that's what froth looks like uh, but now we have a really nice piece our break uh winter let's cross the baby dragon we're gonna have the rlxd tomorrow um, i would say 52 would be the the target here um i don't disagree with the z1 and then there's the hump of the dragon there is the uh, hump of the RL10. This is probably significant because not everybody looks at our stats, but they're looking at previous resistance levels. So 54, it's got to get through. So if you're getting long here, you'll have enough money in hand to protect you. Then if it starts to stall at any of these levels, 
you're executing the two hour battle drill. And then I think if this thing cracks at the belly of the dragon, that's where you, uh, he, he's showing getting short there. And if that's the case, then I absolutely think you must get your second short right in here. Um, and then a third short here in order to get back to 34. Twenty-eight, and obviously that thing could collapse. But yeah, I really like that one, Neo. That's uh, China's not going to let that fail. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You think they're going to let Tesla win? China just went to the moon and got moon rocks. They're trying to be a player in the world. They are a player in the world. If you haven't noticed, they're not going to let their car company fail. That's just a fact. It's that support. This one will break out at 40. Is that breakout? So you can see that the weekly, when you have this, this support and this support, you know, one, two, three, you know, something like a double bottom in here. And up we go with the target of here, 47, that's this one. So this move from here to here is just daily noise. And then if it can get through here, off it really goes because of the break of the week, the weekly dragon hump at 47. Um, this breakdown here with the second position here on the PSAR break and the third position, when it takes out this peak, you know, this is a little support level right in here. And then if that breaks, it gets to here pretty fast. And then if this breaks, yeah, so that's four. So perfectly, perfectly placed uh, for Cisco. Yeah, I like it. That's that's a serious recovery. And it, it wants to get back into here and here where it belongs around 47. So this is a nice one for a day trade because it's very liquid. The the continuation here would look really good because you got a long consolidation zone here, and that would be the second day of momentum. So you're going from 45 and a half to 47. That's a buck 50. So if you're just using intraday like a 50 cent risk, you're getting three to one, and I'd use 50 cents as my position sizing risk. Why not? And I like the short. This would be a danger zone on the short, but if it can get below 44, then man, it, it really collapses because then all of this stuff fails. And now you can see the power and the importance of that piece are as that long continuous chain would be broken by a price below 44. U.S. Steel. I really like the way you're doing this, the weekly and the dailies, Ken. You're making my life very easy. Therefore, I'm a big fan. Here's the froth. Oops. Just invent, we invented our new term today, the froth. The weekly froth starts right here on the accelerating Z3, and then here's where it goes asymptotic. So that is the froth zone, starts like right there at 12. This was the value zone that we talked. To. If you go back and listen to us talking about US Steel saying that seven was the bottom, um, that every previous move up that failed and failed and failed, every time it came back to seven, that was sort of the 
uh, non-controversial solid book value. And so we were making a living going from seven to nine or seven to 10. So here's where that froth goes. And now it goes from 10 to 20. Whoosh. And now it just feels like, oh, okay, that's over. So uh, you could see any, any price below 1650 negates all that. And then there's still a serious move back to 11, you know, so from 16 to 11 is five bucks on 16 is almost like uh, 30%. It's at 26. Let's see. If that works. It's about, uh, yeah, I just call it 30%. So that's a 30% fail that's baked into the cake. And halfway down is the fair value. 1450, which is the skin of the dragon. So when we put up, so 1450, there'd be no doubt whatsoever. And look what he's done nicely here. Ah, sweet. And that's the Bollinger Band main on the daily. <laughs> this feels like effortless action to me. It's now testing. So if that fails, bang, down we go. But if this works, then it gets out of the dragon, then 20 is in sight. But that's only a buck and a half. And so you, if you get that breakout, you should be right there on your wrist box. Not all the way down here, not here. That should only be 50 cents on the way up. And then if you're short from here, you should be using a 50 cent wrist box so you can get a nice position. Because once that starts to fail, you want to you want a nice position on that. So that would be like for me, that'd be about 800 shares on a 50 cent risk. Whereas if I use that entire yellow zone, that's $2. I'd only have 400 shares. No, I'd only have 200 shares. And I, I have some conviction on this one that if that collapses, I'm willing to have 800 shares drilling that thing. But then if it gets to the RL90 and then the Bollinger Band mean, I've made uh, a really nice trade from like 1650 to 1450 on a 50 cent risk. And this is $2. That's, that gives me 4R. But if I use that whole yellow zone, then it's only like 1R. So I don't want that. I want the I want the bigger move. But I like the upside on this one too. U.S. Steel is trading well in both directions. Great intraday trader. Home Depot. You know, Ken, on behalf of everybody else that's listening, we're going to demand that you keep doing it this way. So you've been told. Okay, next up is uh, Home Depot. Let me let that come up on your screen. Are we experiencing a little bit of lag here? Okay, now we're back. All right. Oh, look at he's done a nice job for us here. Um, yeah, it's um, this channel here on the daily. It almost doesn't show in here. It just shows a kind of a steady, continuous decline. But it looks like uh, this peak is this peak and this peak is this peak and this bottom and this bottom are these two. And now this lower low makes this really problematic because now you have a high, I'm going to use the RL10s, a low, a high, a 
a higher low, uh, but a lower high. So this now looks like the anomaly. And therefore, when that cracked, bang, that's why that move was so powerful to the downside, because this had lured people into thinking this was one, two, three, and go. Psych, it failed. And when that cracked, bam, you got this. And now we have a supported spring crossing. This, this move right here, let's see, two, this would have been the entry on that, you know, we talk about that, uh, that trailing Z entry. On this nice rocket move up, this would get you long here at about 270. And I'd like to be long from there. And then add to that position here. I like that. I like adding here. And I like adding there. Um, if I'm not already long from here and I want to get long from here, I think I'd be like right here as my wrist box instead of this giant wrist box. But I'm not opposed to being uh, 277 to 27, having a $7 risk. I'm not opposed to that because I can see $14 to 291 That gets you to here. Yeah, so that's that's a reasonable upside. But if you've got that much risk, you really have to have that much of a move to make a significant contribution. Whereas if you're only using half that as the risk box, you get one, two, three, four chunks on the way up. And each one of those is a measured move about three or four bucks. So uh, I think I'd like to do that. You could even start with half of a position and the smaller risk and then add the full position on when you're there. That's not bad. Downside, yeah, I, I would I think that's where you got to get short at, at the edge of the dragon, and then you capture one and two. I would expect that to hold in a great American company going into the new year. Uh, and then again, if that was your risk, just that little box, you get one, two to the downside. And then if this collapses, look, get, if 260 breaks, look out below. It's coming all the way to 250. So good print. I much prefer the upside to that one because of the nature of the company. Uh, Zoom video. So here's the weekly froth. Come on, Kenneth. Rush. There. Black. Froth is at 300. Which looks like. Yeah, we'll read back in here. So this whole move has been froth. That large excursion out of out of the Z3 is, I think, corresponds with that, doesn't it? Yeah, because that's this is September, and this is the start of uh, this is the start of October. So this is the start of September. So that's this. Pause. Boom. That's this one. Support. This is why you got to love Kata 2. That entry right there. Boy, is that good. You could even argue that this is a I wouldn't argue with you if you said, hey, Ken, isn't that Kata 2 also? I would say yes. Because I would treat the, um, there's a low and a higher low. That makes this Kata 2. Um, then you have a, a second higher low that makes that Kata 2. 
now you have a, a peak in the dragon and a peak in the dragon peak in the dragon so this you can just feel how that all just rolls over so now this breakdown here in the the rolling over of the dragon so this is at like 450 here so this move there's your collapsing dragon by the way and then in a two-day move from you know 470 to 370 that's a 25 percent drop in two days to z3 uh if you let that come all the way back up into here and you gave back 20% and you only keep 10%, see, there's a real there's a nice money management stop right there so that as you lock one, two, three scoops and then you you cash it right there, you get to keep two thirds of the gains off of that short. So now this support level is reflected in the turnover of the RL10 and then the PSAR. So that's, and then it held here again. So 380 is really a place that, um, yeah, this is fine. Uh, of course, it's had five days of failure to fail further. And now you can get long. You could add a second position at the Bollinger Band Mean, a third position at the PSAR, fourth position at the Break of the Dragon, fifth position at the hump of the RL, oops, hump of the RL10 to get back to fair value. Sure, that's what it. That's what the expanding universe to the upside looks like. But then, if this does collapse here, remember it doesn't take much for this all to get back to 310 or 300, where the froth first began. So, I don't know if this downside reflects enough of Zoom's vulnerability. But it's such a darling, it's going to be a continued story. Now, uh, you know, long term, is this the fair value? And do earnings have to catch up to justify this? If you take a look at the, you know, earnings and revenue of these guys, uh, it's clear that all this happens because of, uh, because of COVID. This is all the COVID trade. And businesses adopting this. So if we get COVID under control and people are back to normal, are we going to use Zoom less? Uh, maybe, but not really, because people realize they're in some cases more productive that way than in person. So I think there is a carryover, a residual value baked into Zoom uh, post-COVID that it's, it's easy to see Zoom as a COVID winner. But when COVID's over, it doesn't mean that that all goes away. I think there will be some residual gains and value in Zoom. And that's sort of the argument that maybe um, uh, maybe this is the, the real fair value um, longer term or the support level. Because that's what the RL270 says is fair value. I think that's, that's just a technical term. Yellow jacket in my basement. How in the world is he alive in the winter? That doesn't make sense. All right. Um, so, yeah, I like the upside. I think it has to get through 470 uh, to really be a serious contender for a longer-term swing. Um, yeah, so I think it has to get out of this, out of this box to really start thinking about this level of gain. But really, I think you'll make enough money in here with some judicious trading to carry it with momentum in through here. And then if it gets above 560, it'll look like Tesla. But that's really nosebleed territory. I, I like I like the I like the tactical trade, and that's all it has to be good enough now for the next week or so. So I like that one. Here is 
uh, XOP. Let me let that come up on your screen. Yeah, this is in, uh, this will be in good shape. Um, Chi Wing Chong has identified this as the, you know, the yellow zone. That's that idea we talked about on Saturday, the visual box trading. And you can see he's getting short one, two, three, and four. So that if it does break down below the Bollinger Band mean, that means this will have cracked. And then the move will be to here, you know, which is like uh, a little bit past Z1. And you'll be in great shape on the short side there. Um, and then the upside adding the second position there. Yeah, I think that's a good shape. You know, if this is leg one, leg two, you know, you're hoping by this time, if you get two positions in and a third one up here, you're hoping for a leg three to take you to about 70. And then adding one second position, third position, you'd be in good shape for that move. So that one looks pretty good. And I like that's about a $2 risk. That feels correct. Uh, material sector is next. Yeah, this, this feels like the same kind of industrial approach if XOP is oil exploration. This is the material side of that. There's your second and third positions. Um, if we, let's see, so if we call this leg one, this has kind of been a, a, a lesser powerful leg two. And then this long, painful consolidation but the last couple days have been very strong and we will have the piece are flipped pretty soon and that could be the next leg up and if that were the case we would expect a move of about that much which was like from 64 call it to 70 64 to 70 is six bucks 64 so that's about a and then this one was 69 to 72. That was only three bucks on 70. So that's about uh, maybe 4%. And this move was about eight or 9%. So this third leg, that might only be a 2% move, you know, cause it's fully value, which would get it to about 74. That, that may be all there is, and that's why if it gets beyond there, then there might really be legs, and this might have been the pause that refreshed. So you're really playing an initial trade of about 2%, and then if it gets beyond, you'll, you'll be well positioned with that gain, and that'll be a clear breakout. And then that's where, you know, the last long piece was here, and then you had the nice breakout. So this could be, this could be the intermezzo. And that could be the start of the next leg. So I like that one. And I think we got one more. Uh, Mexico, nice. Um, He's identified, uh, I think, an important double top and failure to follow through. Concur with that. This has been a nice move from consolidation around 34 up into um, 
to this, 41, and then maybe this, 43, but it's had a couple runs at this, hasn't worked, and now the RL30 is rolled over, you know, that's rolled over, we're, we're riding the PSAR. During this move, you can see the distance between price and PSAR narrowing, 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 and it's all come back into the station. We had one break, but then it, it failed, and now it's back into here. So, yeah, uh, let's go. You're either going to go or you're going to fail. That's the very definition of a critical state. So I like all of that in both directions. And EWW is a beauty of a trader intraday for, um, you know, the hybrid frog. So um, this is one of the transitions from uh, from day trading intraday with the minimum manageable risk box to longer term swing trading uh, very seamlessly. So it's a beautiful trader for that. One. So we'll keep keep this one on the radar as we go. All right. So well done, guys. Hopefully you found the opening remarks worthwhile. That was sort of the cover charge. You got to listen to that in order to get to the charts. And we know who's serious. If you can put up with me rambling on that stuff, then you've got the emotional resilience to deal with noise in the markets and uh, and still have the awareness of when it's time to act with effortless action. So uh, that's everything I got for you tonight. Um, let me know what you thought about the presentation. I really like the weekly.